Welcome to part two of the chemistry of life, where we get into more of the organic side of chemistry. Um, the part one was mostly about sort of the unifying aspects of chemistry. Now we're going to get into um, some very introductory organic chemistry. That, uh, that term strikes the fear in the hearts of, of many, but it really isn't all that difficult, especially just the basics that we're going to cover uh, in this lecture. When it comes to organic chemistry, we are talking about carbon. You cannot have an organic compound without carbon. Uh, water is not an organic compound. Salt, not an organic compound. You know why? Because they don't have carbon. That's the fundamental definition. Carbon has six protons, six neutrons. Uh, the average uh, mass is a little more than 12, the, and there are some variants out there. Carbon-14 is a famous one and so forth. So we have six protons, six electrons. Importantly, though, see these four here on the outside? Those are four valence electrons. They're found in the outer shell of this atom. That means the, or, the, compound, the uh, carbon can form up to four different bonds with different uh, atoms and elements. Now, the ability of carbon to form up to four different bonds, whether it's with two or more different atoms and so forth, means that the structures that carbon can form are almost limitless. And that's really hard to swallow. I mean, the, the literally limitless compounds. Very complicated, um, very difficult to kind of wade through thousands or millions of different compounds. And so by function and basic structure, we've identified in biology four families of molecules that we call macromolecules. Uh, macromolecules, uh, because they're polymeric, they are polymers, that is say they have a repeating uh, motif and the single motif, the one submolecule would be called a monomer. So these are the, the four big families. And here's the reveal. We have carbohydrates, we have proteins, we have nucleic acids, your DNA and RNA. And then last but not least, but also last and the most unusual are the lipids. The lipids are the least polymeric of the molecule families here, but nevertheless incredibly important. As I mentioned in the previous slide, we the, the families of molecules, and this does include the lipids to a certain extent. Lipids are just a little bit different, but uh, they're, they still have some things in common. That is to say you can link pieces together in the case of nucleic acids and proteins and carbohydrates, you're linking monomers together to form a polymer. This is called dehydration synthesis. A synthesis means when you're synthesizing something, you're making something. Well, the reason we call it dehydration is that you end up with a water molecule at the end. So you have your polymer and a molecule of water. That's why it's called dehydration synthesis. Yes, it requires energy. Um, you're linking molecules together, and energy is stored in that chemical bond that you just formed. So that's why you have to input energy. The other uh, mechanism, the other common reaction, extremely common, is that you have a polymer, multiple subunits here. There's three here. And you break one of those bonds into a two and a one. So now we've got our monomer over here, and we still have a little a, a dimer. This has got two, two, two subunits in it. And you're breaking, and that, do, that reaction requires water. You need to insert an H on one and an OH on the other. This is known as hydrolysis. Lysis means to break up or destroy. And since we're using water, now we've got hydrolysis. Hydrolysis, where you use a water molecule, you actually bust up the water molecule in order to bust up that polymer. So we have dehydration synthesis when we're putting uh, subunits together, and we have hydrolysis when we're, when we're breaking subunits apart. Two extremely common reactions in biological systems. So let's move into our first family, carbohydrates. Everybody knows about carbohydrates. You know, they, they supply energy and all that fun stuff. 
If I had one wish in this world, I would tell you to stop thinking about carbohydrates as energy. Okay, stop. Just stop it. Okay, you know why? Because carbohydrates are so much more important than just energy. Yes, they are a ready source of energy. They're not the only source of energy for starters. But secondly, they are super important structurally and super important for other things in the body. The monomer in a carbohydrate is what we call a simple sugar. Usually it's a five or a six carbon, often a ring, okay? And you link them together with dehydration synthesis. So here's our simple sugar. This is glucose, very, very common, not the only simple sugar out there. Another word for simple sugar is monosaccharide, okay? That saccharide being the, the subunit, the monomer, if you will. So it's one monomer, glucose, very common, a uh, bunch of other ones out there. A disaccharide means you have two of the monosaccharides linked together, again, by dehydration synthesis. Sucrose is a great example of this. And if I remember correctly, sucrose is actually two glucose molecules linked together. With a, what they call a glycosidic bond, but it's created by its dehydration synthesis. Polysaccharides, this means more than two or three or four or five or ten. Starches, like if you're uh, hungry for a baked potato or something and you go, uh, you know, mash the white part of the potato into, uh, oh, you're going to make mashed potatoes instead of baked potatoes. Okay, fine. Well, the starch is that whitish material that you see on the inside of a potato. That's a polysaccharide. It's a, it's a long uh, ch set of chains of monosaccharides. If you break down the starches, you'll end up with glucose, maybe a few other kinds of sugars. Carbohydrates are great for energy, like I say, but forget about that. Everybody already knows that, all right? You know it. Everybody else in the world knows it. You don't have to teach anybody that. But what carbs are really important for is a whole lot of other stuff. Like, for instance, recognizing self versus non-self, okay? Cells have carbohydrates on the outside of their cells in order to identify the kind of cell that they are. Your blood type is rooted in carbohydrates. A, B, if you're O, you don't have those carbohydrates. But if you're positive, you have a form of carbohydrate out there. Okay, so as far as examples of monosaccharides, we've already talked about glucose. Six carbons, okay, six carbons that forms a hexagon. Remember how I said you shouldn't think of carbs as energy. Yes, energy is one thing, but it's not the only thing, and it's not even really the most important thing, to be honest with you. But everybody knows carbs for energy, so let's show you some examples of carbs that are not energy. Well, let's start with deoxyribose. Five carbons, not six. It's part of the nucleotide in DNA. The D in DNA stands for deoxyribose. DNA is deoxyribonucleic acid. It's a very weak organic acid. It's also what makes up our DNA. And sugars are part of that, and they're not really necessarily energy. Now, you also have ribose, another five-carbon sugar. This is the R in RNA. Again, not necessarily for energy, okay? Very important. Five carbons forms a, a, a pentagon rather than a hexagon. Fructose, and I remember in the previous slide, I thought it was two molecules of glucose. It's actually one molecule of glucose and one molecule of fructose that gives us sucrose, that's your ordinary table sugar that you uh, put on, uh, on uh, put in your coffee and so forth. That is a molecule of fructose linked to a molecule of glucose. And then for you milk lovers out there, galactose is a monosaccharide. When linked with glucose forms a molecule we're all familiar with, which is lactose. Lactose is a disaccharide, and that's the thing that people are uh, sensitive to because they can't break the bond between the glucose and galactose. That's why. And then the bacteria love it. Okay. But in any case, these are all examples of uh, sugars. Glucose and fructose and galactose are all six carbon sugars, so they form a hexagon kind of a ring. Deoxyribose and ribose form a pentagon five carbon ring. And again, try to, try to get the idea of energy out of your brain. That's, that would be a good thing, because there's so much more. 
And here are some common disaccharides. By the way, if you see OSE, OS, think sugar, okay? All right, glucose, fructose, galactose, lactose, sucrose. Okay, they're all sugars. Dextrose, which is also sucrose, by the way. These are all carbs, but they're formed by two subunits, okay? So they're two monosaccharides. Sucrose, glucose, and fructose. There it is. Lactose, glucose, and galactose. Oh, maltose. That's the one. That's my favorite. I love malts. You know, when you get a like a vanilla malt, oh my God. Chocolate malt, oh heck yeah. Okay. Those are two glucoses linked together. So that's maltose. And it has this lovely creamy flavor. That's really, really awesome. It's okay. So these are examples of common disaccharides. They're made up of two monosaccharides formed by Dehydration synthesis, right? Broken down by hydrolysis. So here's an example of maltose, two glucoses linked together in that, that covalent, also known as a glycosidic covalent bond. And now we're into polysaccharides. They're very, very complicated structures. If you can, you can make not just chains of these things, but also sort of like they look like palm fronds. Okay, so look at a look at a palm frond, and you can see carbon, you know, carbon rings of the the monomers going off, and they branch out. They look like kelp underwater. In any case, complex carbohydrates, polysaccharides. Sure, we have them in starches. Okay, starches are often found in plant um, uh, in plant uh, tissue. Uh, again, yeah, yes, they're for, for energy storage. They can also be used for some other things, but uh, primarily they're in this case that's energy storage. And since I'm on the energy storage kick, in animals we use a different polymer. It's slightly different than starch. It's called glycogen. It's a polymeric uh, glucose. And these black dots you see in here are granules of glycogen. Your liver is full of glycogen. It contains about a pound of glycogen. Your muscle also contains some glycogen too because you can break it down into glucose and then make ATP from it. Okay, so here I'm breaking my own rule. We're starting with energy stuff first, but that's, that's fine. Remember, not just energy. And here's an example. If you have a piece of paper, hopefully you're taking notes right now. Well, you're taking notes on a sheet of, of glucose, the polymer called cellulose. Cellulose is just a different form of polymer from, say, glucose, both created by plants, all right? And they're, they're different variants of the polymers of glucose. Then a fun one, and I'm not exactly a fan of the tick here. I mean, it could have been almost anything. Could have been something a little more delicious, like, say, a shrimp or a lobster. Okay, could have been, come on, people, let's have some better pictures. Chitin forms the shells of many things, like, for instance, shrimp or lobster, or in this case, ticks or insects. They all contain an exoskeleton made up of a polymer of glucose called chitin. And the lovely part about chitin is that chitin can degrade. So what we do is we will actually make sutures um, if you do, if you're involved in emergency medicine at all, and you, and somebody's getting those really really deep sutures, like when they need like 200 stitches or something, where they're stitching stuff together down underneath the skin, they use chitin because what'll happen is the body can absorb that. So you put those sutures in in order to hold the tissues together, and over time the the, the tissues will degrade the chitin and uh, reabsorb it. So that makes chitin a lovely, lovely material, more so than an, an exoskeleton of a tick. Okay, let's make it a delicious animal, like I said. Make it shrimp. I'm hungry for shrimp for some reason. Okay, these are all polymers of, of carbohydrates. Glu glucose is the primary one, but some other ones can be mixed in there as well. Moving on from carbohydrates, now we have proteins. And the monomer for proteins is an amino acid. There's an NH2, that's an amino uh, functional group. All right, the nitrogen, two hydrogens. Then over here, the COOH is called a carboxylic acid. That's why we call it an amino acid. You link two amino acids together, okay? 
remove a, remove a water while you're at it. You see this OH is gone and one of those H's is gone. Okay, there's a water out here somewhere. That forms a peptide. Okay, that's why I call it a peptide bond. And you string those together, you get a protein. And this is dehydration synthesis here. So proteins provide structure, but they also provide function. That is to say that most of the doers, the biochemical doers, if you will, the effectors, are proteins, they're enzymes, signals, um, and so forth. So you have a string of amino acids. So on the previous slide, you had uh, those two, and then you can make a bunch of them, and you can have this what's called a polypeptide chain. Well, you can take that polypeptide chain and make three-dimensional structure out of it. So that series of amino acids, that linear sequence of amino acids, is called primary structure. Then you can take that primary chain and start to either make it into a helix or you can sort of make it into a zigzagging sheet. That's known as secondary structure. Then you can take those helices and those sheets and bend them around like a like a like a paperclip or or whatever and create three-dimensional structure called tertiary structure. There's even a fourth level called quaternary where you take two peptides, two two protein, you know, peptide molecules and you bind them together to form multi-subunit uh, complex structure. So let's take a look at that picture in the next slide. And so here it is shown. So we have the linear primary structure. It's just linear like this. There's no three-dimensional shape. It's just a sort of a, uh, shall we say, one-dimensional entity. It's not really one-dimensional, but in the case of proteins, it is. Then you can either form a helix out of it. This is due to hydrogen bonds, by the way. Either a helix like this or a sheet where it zigzags and forms a kind of a sheet kind of a deal. Um, hard to see here. It's easier to kind of see a helix. In any case, that's secondary structure. And when you take these helical and sheet-like structures and, and create a three-dimensional complex array, that's tertiary structure. And here's a little, you know, cofactor or something in there. It's something, you know, that's, that's bonding non-covalently. Then you can take that tertiary structure and you can create multiple structures of those of those tertiaries. So these are four different peptides that are non-covalently bonded to form what we call quaternary structure. So primary, secondary, tertiary is more complicated three-dimensional structure. And then we can make, th this could be a subunit of a larger complex of quaternary structure. Most proteins are multi-subunit. Um, for instance, hemoglobin, okay? This actually looks a little bit like a hemoglobin molecule. You have two alphas and two betas. That's very much resembles a hemoglobin for tertiary structures non-covalently bonded. And guess what? We have hemoglobin. Two alphas, two betas, just like before, only less cartoonish, okay? These are heme groups. These are the, the molecules that have a little iron inside them. Iron is a very dangerous element. It's very, very reactive. So we keep it locked up inside a cage of carbon and nitrogen called a heme. All right. And so we have those irons in those heme groups. This is hemoglobin. It's quaternary structure. One, two, three, four peptides. Each of those peptides has tertiary structure made up of helices and sheets. That's secondary structure. And if we dug real deep, we could see the original amino acid sequence. That would be primary structure. So as I said before, proteins are, the, are a major effector of function in, in biological systems. They are the doers, okay? So certainly structural. So for instance, our cytoskeleton is made up of protein polymers like actin and tubulin. Um, keratin, if you've ever heard of the phrase keratin, that's what's in your hair and your fingernails. That's a uh, protein. A lot of proteins, super important, are enzymes. They facilitate chemical reactions. Okay, they make chemical reactions possible at homeostatic temperatures. 
right? Um, for instance, we can hydrolyze glucose to make water. We can oxidize glucose. You just set it on fire. Well, we don't see ourselves bursting into flames all that often, or hopefully not. Okay, that's because fire is not a temperature that is consistent with life. Most life runs somewhere between, shall we say, 10 degrees Fahrenheit and 120 degrees Fahrenheit. So around, around 100 degrees swing there that you can see life. There, there's some exceptions. Well, the flame in a glucose is about 750 degrees. Okay, well beyond what's biologically relevant. So what an enzymes will do is allow for that oxidation of glucose to occur at 98.6, which allows us to be 98.6 degrees. All right. So these are the things that facilitate. Rather, catalyze is not a great word. Nobody knows what that means. All right. Well, some of us do. I mean, after a while. But facilitate. They allow biochemical reactions to occur at temperatures that are consistent with life. We have receptors, okay, they're not dissimilar from enzymes, but what they do is they will bind and or change shape in, in response to a stimulus, okay? So let's say you press one finger onto the back of your other arm. You can feel that touch because what's happening is that physical pressure is changing the shape of a protein receptor on a nerve inside your left arm. If you take your right index finger and push it into your left arm, you are activating receptors. Receptors can be sensitive to the presence or absence of a chemical, okay? They can be uh, sensitive to pressures, to temperatures, any number of things, all right? So that's what we call receptors. Other things, other functional proteins, for certainly antibodies, they're, they're changing shape in the presence of what's called an antigen. Um, we have uh, proteins that are involved in binding DNA and changing what genes are expressed. Neuropeptides, these are basically like neurotransmitters. They send signals from one neuron to another. Bunch of stuff out there. That's really cool. We can sort of break it out into these kind of four major, uh, major categories of function. On to the nucleic acids. Nucleic acid, nucleic acid, deoxyribose and ribose. All right, those are the two major forms. There's some other, there's some other ones out there. Don't want to talk about them. Um, again, they're polymers. They're polymers of nucleotides. All right, these guys allow for the storage of information and or the conveying of information to create a protein. All right, we call that the central dogma. Central dogma says that you have genetic information in the DNA, which gets transcribed into RNA, which then that RNA then moves out into the cytosol, where it is translated into a protein of a given structure. So that's the central dogma. So DNA is holding on to information that can then be used to make proteins, all right? By the way, they're looking at making DNA as a way of storing other types of information, like in, uh, like for instance, like say you want to save your data on your hard drive. They're talking about DNA hard drives now. It's absolutely amazing. Okay, but it, and it's very efficient. It's very very small and very very can be compacted very very efficiently. So here's a fundamental nucleotide. Okay. This, we're going to start right here. This is the sugar I was talking about earlier. This is the sugar. This is either a ribose or a deoxyribose. Ribose has OHs here at the two and three positions. Deoxyribose only has it at the three. Okay. This is, doesn't have a it doesn't have an OH at the two. That's the main difference. I'm not going to test you on that. But it's five carbon sugar. One, two, three, four, five. That's an oxygen there. All right. So we got a sugar. We have this funky thing over here. It can be a hexagon like this, or it can actually be kind of a hexagon pentagon thing, uh, depending on the type of base that it is. And this isn't like the base, like acid base. This is a, a different connotation of the meaning base. So we have two basic forms. You have this hexagon form, and then you have this sort of double ring hexagon pentagon form. And those are the G, C, slash, T, A bases, all right? 
Then the last piece of the puzzle is this phosphate, a phosphorus uh, uh, atom surrounded by four oxygens. Very, very polar. That's a monomer. This is called a nucleoside. Okay. Actually, they, call, they say nucleotide here. That's because it would have phosphates. But in any case, this is the monomer for, um, for DNA and RNA. And so you get polymers of these nucleotides. Like we have one polymer here and one polymer here. And they can associate based on their nitrogenous base. All right. If, if it's an A, it can form two bonds, two hydrogen bonds. See how they're dotted there? Talked about that earlier. Two hydrogen bonds with the base called T, thymine. If it's a guanine, it can form three hydrogen bonds with cytosine. And that is the basis for the information. Just those four defines all that we are. It's just stunning that you can use just four bases to do everything that we do as human beings. Pretty amazing. So here are the molecules showing you the bases. Okay, so here's adenine. Remember I talked about a, a hexagon pentagon ring? That's the nitrogenous base for A. All right. Forms two bonds with its counterpart, its hexagon-shaped counterpart called thymine. Guanine, okay, again, that's that funky double ring structure with a hexagon ring in cytosine. Now, why can't... Thymine bind with guanine, uh, your guess is as good as mine, but um, I think it has something to do with where that oxygen is because these are all hydrogen bonds here, okay? But again, A and T bind together and C and G bind together. A with two bonds, C and G with three. Now, of course, what would it be a biology class if we didn't have some kind of a complication, right? You know, sorry about that. Well, can't help it. It wasn't my fault. If we have A, T, G, and C in DNA, RNA doesn't have T. Instead, it has this other hexagon-shaped molecule called uracil. And one of the things about having uracil in there is that it is much less likely to form double-stranded structures. It can, and it does. It just doesn't do it quite as readily as DNA does. All right. You see RNA in a more of a single strand paradigm. You, you, they fold back and they will bind each other, but not in the same way, not as cleanly as DNA does. So A, C, G, and U for uracil. Our last family here are the fatty acids and the lipids. The lipids are the larger family, and fatty acids are the kind of the they're kind of the polymeric uh, member of the lipids. Fatty acids form these sort of you know, zigzag carbon molecules um, and that are used in fats and other things. So if there was a, um, a, a polymeric aspect to lipids, it would be the fatty acids. All right. And of course, fats we use, uh, also known as triglycerides, we use for energy storage. Okay, that's great. Everybody knows that. So it's nothing special. You're not going to get paid extra for that. Where the really interesting stuff and the more fun stuff, I would argue, is the, the functions of carbohydrates and fats that are not energy. For instance, phospholipids. It has a polar head group and two fatty acid tails. Really important for cell membranes, whether it's the plasma membrane on the outside of the cell or organelle membranes inside the cell. Super duper important and not an energy component. Okay. The other really fun one that I like, because I'm kind of interested in endocrinology to begin with, is that a lot of our steroid hormones, okay, you know, steroids, right? They, sometimes they call them corticosteroids, and there's some other names for them. Estrogen, testosterone, androstenedione, and so forth. Those are formed from lipids. It turns out the most common precursor for the steroid hormones is a compound you all know and love called cholesterol. Cholesterol is one of the most common hormone precursors. So cortisol and estrogen are both derived from cholesterol. So lipids are certainly for energy, but they're also important for cell membranes 
and certainly important for biosynthesis of other molecules, including hormones. They're precursors for, for steroid hormones in particular. So here's a fatty acid. It's showing you the, the schematic here, that zigzag. And these are all carbons. These are all carbons, all right? Until you get to one end, and then you have a carboxylic acid, a carboxyl group is another way to call it. It's carboxylic acid, and that's why we call it a fatty acid. All right. It has a long carbon tail, very nonpolar, and then you have this right here. This is what you can use to link it to other stuff. That's the cool part. That's like, um, it's like the docking mechanism, you know, it's like the little knuckle thing on a, on a train car. You know, you got the train. And you have that little knuckle, and then you can hook it up to another train car. All right. So fatty acids are kind of the monomeric member of, of lipids. And now we need to get into the fact that fatty acids not only have this carbon nonpolar thing going on, which is great for, for certain aspects, but you have to have some function. How do we differentiate function? How do we make this behave differently than just, um, just a floppy chain of carbons and hydrogens? Well, one way to do that is to add a double bond. Okay. If you have a carbon fatty acid and it's nothing but single bonds, this thing is, first of all, very floppy because each of those single bonds can spin. So it's like a wet noodle, okay? I want you to do an experiment. I want you to do this while you're listening to me. I want you to take your left hand and your right hand, and I want you to touch your left index finger to your right middle finger and touch your right index finger to your left middle finger. So your so your left hand thumb is going to be down and your right hand thumb is going to be up. Now listen closely here. Those fingers now have formed what we call a double bond. Let's just put our two index fingers together and you can spin that around. You can spin those two fingers around and they will still stay in contact. But again, if you put your index, if you match index finger to middle finger, right hand to left hand, now you've got the fingers. You can't spin that. That cannot be spun. And your one thumb has to stay down and your other thumb has to stay up. Okay? That's the magic of a double bond. It can't spin. Okay? Now let's flip one of your hands. And so now it's index finger to index finger and middle finger to middle finger. If your thumbs represent the rest of the carbon chain, you can see now they're not in a straight line. If you flip it back to its original conformation where your index and middle finger, you can see that your thumb and your, your thumbs, while not parallel, can form a sort of straight line. But if we if we if we match middle finger to middle finger and index finger to index finger now those thumbs are both pointing in the same direction that's what's going on in these other molecules is that you can get a kink okay those double bonds can't spin and so what happens is they introduce a kink into the molecule and that fundamentally changes how these things behave Okay, if you have a fatty acid like this, this is stearic acid found in a lot of meats. So if you go into a Burger King or something, you smell that meaty smell, you're smelling the stearic acid. Okay, this solidifies at a relatively high temperature. It's a lot like butter. Okay, butter can exist in a solid form at room temperature. Heat it up just a little bit, it, it, it melts. But if you look at olive oil at room temperature, it's a liquid. Even though olive oil chemically is very similar to that butter, nevertheless, the olive oil has double bonds. It is unsaturated. When we say saturated here, it means it's all single bonds. But if it's unsaturated, it has one, maybe two, maybe three double bonds. Okay, that changes the melting point. And so now, like for instance, linoleic acid and linoleic acid are found quite often in, in, in olive oil. And so olive oil exists in a liquid at room temperature. Profound implications on biology. 
the, the idea of saturated versus unsaturated. Turns out animal cells have a lot more saturated fats in them, even if they don't eat meat, okay? And plants tend to have more unsaturated. Oh, by the way, if you go get a um, go get a salmon from the North, uh, North Atlantic, you know, real cold water, you know what happens is those salmon have a lot more double bonds in their in their cell membrane fatty acids. That's why salmon's so good for you. It's got those unsaturations in it. Okay, omega-3 fatty acids. Okay, that's because the the omega-3 implies that there's a double bond in there. Okay, it's got a kink in it. Much healthier for you. Doesn't form cholesterol. So here's uh, here's a fat molecule, and these don't polymerize. These don't polymerize. They just associate to form fats, okay? This is a triglyceride. If you uh, get into blood tests and so forth, you might hear about triglyceride levels, okay? Because, again, these things will form, they will, they will glom together. And a triglyceride is three fatty acids, one, two, three, and they can be different lengths. They can even have, some can have kinks and others may not, all right? They can be different kinds of fatty acids in here, but there are three of them. And they are bonded to a three-carbon molecule known as glycerol. All right. Dehydration synthesis right there. Okay. It bonds to this, this, this three-carbon glycerol and this triglyceride. It, and when you get a bunch of them and they start associating together because of hydrophobic interactions, you get a fat. Okay. So they don't polymerize like nu like nucleotides and, and carbohydrates and, and proteins. Now, yes, you get a kind of a thing going on here, but that's not that's not relevant to us. You just have different shapes of fatty acids, different lengths of fatty acids. And so here's a phospholipid. It has a polar head group. Here's glycerol. That's glycerol, believe it or not. Okay, that's a glycerol skeleton there. Only the glycerol isn't bound to three fatty acids. It's only bound to two. That third carbon in glycerol is bound to a polar molecule. And these things can differ as well. Not important to know that, the, just understand that not all phospholipids are the same. They differ in the length of the fatty acids and or the saturation of the fatty acid. This one has a double bond in it, which makes it rigid right there, gives it a little kink. Okay, so the fatty acids can have different lengths and they can have a different number of, of double bonds in them. Most common is one, occasionally two, maybe three. But the reason this is a phospholipid is you, you've got the third carbon is bound to a phosphate and then some other chemical group that gives the polar head some chemical properties. And it looks like this little funky thing over here, like a funky hair clip. All right, polar head group. Non-polar fatty acid tail, and what do you get? You get a cell membrane because those fatty acids are non-polar, like oil and water. Oil associates with oil, water associates with water, so we get a phospholipid. One of the little oddities in lipids is that it's a family of of non-polar compounds. You know, oil. You know, lipophilic is the is the actual term that's used most often. That they are oil loving. Um, you've seen the fatty acids, and, and we've talked a little bit about the fact that these things serve as precursors for hormones. Well, here's the family, the subfamily, if you will, of compounds uh, known as steroids. And you can spot a steroid a mile away because it has this A, B, C, D ring. So it has a hexagon, 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 pentagon. I'm not too worried about you knowing exactly whether it's a pentagon or a hexagon. These are all carbons, by the way, and these are all uh, covalent bonds. Like here's a double bond in the covalent uh, double bond. But you can see that that same basic structure of carbon, which is why it's so lipophilic, which is why it's apolar, uh, you can see that here in cholesterol, and cholesterol is the common precursor for things like testosterone and estrogens and so forth. So um, even if you never ate a single molecule of cholesterol in your life, your body would still make cholesterol. The problem that we have with cholesterol is that we eat too much of it. All right, that's the key. And there are good and bad forms. You'll get to that point sometime down the line. But in any case steroids all have this common ABCD carbon ring, 
Okay, they are lipids again because they're nonpolar. They don't form they don't form polymers. They just associate by their lipophilicity or hydrophobicity. If you're lipophilic, you're hydrophobic. If you're hydrophilic, you're lipophobic. That's that's how it goes. But these are steroids, and again, just knowing about them uh, will help you uh, down the line. And so here's a nice summary of of um, of the of the different uh, four different major biological molecules. You can see here we've got a chain of carbohydrates. Here those little hexagons are all individual monosaccharides. All right. Yeah, they're energy sources, but forget about it. Okay, that's not what I care about because everybody knows that already. Again, what are we doing with the with the with the carbohydrates? That's not involved with energy. All right. So certainly we can store carbohydrates in the form of things like starches, all right? We can use it to make plant cell walls and structure. Um, chitin, again, we use those for, for sutures, and that's the exoskeleton of uh, arthropods. Um, and carbohydrates serve a really, really important self versus non-self role. They help cells identify themselves, and we can identify potential pathogens based on the carbohydrates on the surface. Again, fats and lipids, all right, yeah, we get the energy thing. Let it go, all right? Certainly have triglycerides, and again, these things are important for things, you know, the lipids are important for things like the phospholipids, all right? For important for making signals like the steroids, all right? This is a steroid right here. Really important for cell signaling, hormonal signaling, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, fatty acids you use for a number of things. For instance, if you feel pain somewhere, it's because the cells have converted a fatty acid into a pain signal. Kind of interesting. So, okay, so don't worry about the energy so much. Work on the other stuff. Proteins are the doers. That's the that's the little phrase that I would tell you. They are the doers, either in terms of a structure, if we're talking about a, a fibrous protein, or it's catalytically active, like in the form of an enzyme, and then we have components in cell membranes and so forth, like channels and receptors and all sorts of fun stuff. So again, think the doers. And then things that, that cells do or things that cells are shaped by, that's that's what a protein's all about. And then lastly, the nucleic acids. All right, so it's got a sugar. Now I got that red thing there is a sugar. That's a pentagon. It's a ribose or a deoxyribose sugar. You got the nitrogenous base and you have the phosphate. Okay, the two major players are DNA and RNA, deoxyribonucleic acid, ribonucleic acid. And these are involved in, in information storage. So you store the, the components of what a protein will be in terms of its amino acid sequence in the DNA. And to get that signal out to where it can be manufactured into a protein, we use RNA. So for our last slide, let's put these pieces together, all right? Let's start uh, down here in the blue area. This is the inside of the cell. We've got these little fibrous looking things. Those are proteins, structural proteins, probably microfilaments made of actin, cytoskeleton, okay? In the cytosol, we're going to have water and we're also going to have ions. You remember ions from uh, forever ago in this lecture? Ions, we're going to have things like glucose, and we're going to have uh, soluble proteins. Then we've got a, uh, this is showing you sort of the tertiary structure of a, what they call a glycoprotein. Why, why is it a glycoprotein? Because you can see this little branched chain here. Okay, those are meant to be carbohydrates. So there's a carbohydrate chain, there's a carbohydrate, there's one there. Okay, if you see carbohydrate chains like that, you can presume that this is the exterior surface of the cell. Remember how I said that carbohydrates serve a very important uh, cell identification role? That's due to the glycoprotein uh, configuration on the outside of the cell. Uh, we've got another protein here. This protein is a lot, is convey, is, 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 can facilitate diffusion. It's called a channel protein. All right. We'll get to extracellular matrix we did in the in the live lecture, but remember the the extracellular matrix is often full of carbohydrates and stuff. We don't have any any images here. There's no cartoons of the extracellular matrix. This is just about the membrane here. We've got our lipids here. So here's our hydrophilic polar head, the blue circles. 
and you've got the fatty acid tails associated with each other. So you've got this hydrophobic region inside the plasma membrane that makes a very, very good barrier. Not much gets through this plasma membrane unless it is allowed, okay? And you can see just teeny tiny in here, those little little golden things, those are little, the, the four rings of cholesterol, the, the, cholesterol, the steroid nucleus of cholesterol, all right? So we got phospholipids. Where are the proteins? Find them. Find them, okay? I'm telling you right now, they're not where my pointer is right now, okay? There's one right there. It's kind of off in the distance. Here's one going through. This is a transmembrane protein, all right? It's a glycoprotein because it has a carbohydrate on it. And we got a channel protein here, again, coming through the membrane. There's one way out there, and there's one here, and there's one here. You can even see a teeny one right there, all right? The glycocalyx is just saying the, the exterior surface, and, and that's where – do you see any carbohydrates over here? Any cartoons of carbohydrates? No. All you have are the cholesterols inside the uh, – inside the plasma membrane. And the cholesterols are serving as a fluidity buffer. I talked about that in class. They help keep the membrane at the right level of fluidity, not too densely packed like butter. Butter is actually what we call a liquid crystal. You know that? And not too loose like machine oil. We don't want, you know, it's not going to work well if it's too loose. It won't serve a barrier. So we want to have that perfect in between and cholesterol helps with that. All right. So, the key is to begin thinking about this. I know that some of this stuff doesn't come easy, but the mistake you will make is trying to abbreviate the abbreviation. Believe it or not, everything in this these last two videos, if you get that locked down pretty good, will make your life forever easier. Forever. I'm not kidding. I, I'm speaking from experience here make your life forever easier because this is the stuff that justifies the functions and things that we see down the line. I know you want to get straight to interventions. I know you want to get straight to where you are trying to get to in nursing and that sort of a thing. But that's like trying to be a skier going straight down the hill. You're going to get somebody hurt or killed. Not kidding. All right. Learn this stuff. This is the stuff that will save lives down the line, will make you a better collaborator with physicians, with specialists, with other people in your healthcare team. It will help you explain some of the, the therapies that you're going to be administering to these patients, explain why they need something or don't need something. It will feel far away from where you want to be, but this will make your life easier. So that's all I'm going to say. Thank you for your time. Uh, I hope you found this lecture useful. I, I'm kind of shooting from the hip with some of this stuff because I think you guys are a little more pragmatic group, and I want you to understand that I I know where you're coming from, or at least I think I know where you come from. I'm, I'm doing my best, okay? Can't say I'm perfect. I can't read minds, but I sense the way you guys are approaching the the class that this is this is this stuff is feels like an obstruction to you, and we want to show you why this stuff has meaning. That's where it could, because it, again, it'll make your life easier. So good luck. Ask questions. Keep plugging away. Have patience with yourself. Respect the process. And I will uh, see you when I'm looking at you. Goodbye.